Good morning, and half a day. The Committee on General Government Operation Appropriation Housing is now called to order. For the record, today is Tuesday, July 13, 2021, and the time now is 9.03. Notice for this budget hearing was disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets. First public notice was issued on Tuesday, July 6, and second notice was issued on July 8 and July 12. The committee will hear and accept testimonies on Bill 55-36 COR, the Fiscal Year 2022 Appropriation Act, as requested by the Governor, relative to the Department of Public Works Fiscal Year 2022 Budget Request. Joining me for this budget hearing is, begin with uh, the Speaker, Therese Serlai, Senator Brown, and my Vice Chair, Senator Amanda Shelton, and the Oversight Chair is walking in in, a, in about a minute. The general rules of this budget hearing shall be as follows. Those testifying on behalf of Bill 55-36 COR relative to the Department of Public Works are, have been invited to the panel. We have the director, Vince Ariola, and uh, we have Heidi Carlos, who will probably be working on the slides, and Mr. Joe Kinata. Written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide my latest staff with your written testimony for photocopy. Testimonies may be read, and lengthy testimonies should be summarized to about five minutes. But for this public hearing, um, public works, you will be allowed, panel will be allowed beyond the five minutes, because you have some slides to present. And we're only here to discuss your budget. Those testifying will be allowed to present oral testimony. Once you're done, please remain in the room for questions and, or for additional testimony as may be desired by members of the committee. Question and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the budget hearing room. Proper form and decorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for these proceedings. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form and decorum may be restricted from providing oral testimony and will be asked or be removed from the room. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. Please state your name and your title for the record. I'll ask now the panel to please rise as the Sergeant Arms will swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Under penalty of perjury, do you all affirm that any and all information that you provide today, whether it be verbally, electronically, and in writing, be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God. Okay. So, Chair, they're under oath. You may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Arms. Now I ask the, uh, Mr. Ariola to please, um, you have slides, so please begin your, your testimony on your budget. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. For the record, my name is Vince Ariola. I'm the director at the Department of Public Works. I am joined here by our chief planner, uh, Jose Pep Kinata, uh, and I apologize for our deputy director not being here, but she is tending to a family uh, medical issue. I, I ask for your uh, indulgence there. Um, members of the committee, on behalf of the fine men and women at the Department of Public Works, I am pleased to present our proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. DPW's total budget request amounts to $17.4 million. In the past few years, DPW has received two major funding sources that was approved for legislative appropriations for our general operational costs. The funding sources are the Territorial Educational Facilities Fund, TEF, and the Guam Highway Fund, the GHF. For FY 2022, DPW's operational costs related to bus operations will be fully funded by the TEF, whereas all other divisions, administrative, highways, capital improvement projects, transportation maintenance, and building maintenance will be funded by the GHF. The amount requested of 17.4 for FY 2022 consists of 10.5 million from the GHF and 6.9 million from the TEF. This budget request is a reduction of 837,580 from our current FY 2021 budgeted amount. The budget submitted at the time takes into account estimated revenues, current uh, 2021 expenses, and proposed expenses for the coming fiscal year. I will be discussing this more specifically later in my testimony. 
Moving forward, DPW is prepared to work within our given budget levels. As we all understand, we are still dealing with COVID-19 issues island-wide, and it appears this may be the case for a while. The AG agency has been diligent in following all he health and safety protocols to ensure our government offices, employees, and customers are protected to the greatest extent possible. Our statutory uh, responsibilities include providing government-wide services such as daily school bus transportation service for DOE and private school students, maintenance of school buses, various road construction and earth-moving heavy equipment, and other light vehicles, developing and maintaining Guam's roadways to include highway construction, flood mitigation and road maintenance, managing the government of Guam's capital improvement projects, which, which also entails permitting and regulating Guam's private construction activities, and maintaining GovGuam's buildings, facilities, and equipment. DPW has six divisions, uh, starting with the Administrative Services Division. This division provides administrative, financial, and budget management, and personnel support to all programs under the purview of the department. Some of the responsibilities uh, include correspondence, policies, reports, fiscal accounting, budget finance, human resources, um, property management, storekeeping, grants management, and the like. Our building maintenance division, this division, as small as it is, takes care of all the maintenance services, repairs, construction services, and custodial work to upkeep all our public buildings and other government facilities as needed. Our bus operations, bus ops, this division provides and ensures safe transportation services for public and private students to and from their respective schools throughout the school year. They provide safe busing services for school-related activities such as field trips and sporting events. They also provide emergency evacuations and other busing services as authorized by the Governor of Guam and or the Director. And if I could just stop right there, uh, during the COVID um, pandemic uh, period, the bus operations was highly critical in transporting our passengers uh, to and from the airport to our, uh, our COVID facilities uh, down in Tumon. Our Capital Improvement Projects Division provides professional and technical services for the government's infrastructure projects and technical support to the community. They review and assess building plans, perform construction estimates, and evaluate the conditions of current government buildings. Our Highways Division provides overall management and administration of the Guam Highway and Village Streets program, including planning, designing, and construction of all roadways and capital improvement projects. In addition, they re maintain, repair, and restore Guam's highway system, which includes all primary, secondary, and collective roads, village streets, our steel and concrete bridges, flood control systems, ponding basins, guardrail maintenance, traffic directional signs, street names, and as, as you see, the list just goes on and on. Our transportation maintenance division provides the maintenance and repair of all our department vehicles, buses, heavy equipment, and other operational equipment. This also serves, this division also serves as the official motor pool custodian and fleet inventory manager for all GovGuam line agency vehicles. In terms of our operational needs, our FY22 budget requests essentially a status quo level, which is sufficient to meet current operations based on our department's mandates. Most of DPW's operational costs are personnel costs, including overtime costs for emergency first responders, transportation and highway maintenance workers, as well as heavy equipment mechanics. We understand the reduction in our budget may be due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our economy. We will work to utilize all funding sources available to the agency for FY22 just as we perform during the height of the pandemic. Other operational costs include the need to purchase supplies and equipment, maintenance, roads and pothole repairs, replacement parts, tires, batteries, fuel and oil for heavy and light vehicles, and fuel for our school buses and repairs and renovations of DPW and government buildings. In terms of our manpower needs, the staffing pattern for FY22 does not include funded vacancies. At last year's budget hearing, I talked about filling as many, many vacancies as we could, and I believe we've done that. We did that. Our primary concern with regard to personnel is to keep our staffing levels of our bus drivers at safe and efficient levels. We should have a full complement of bus drivers by the end of the fiscal year, as 
we are recruiting today as I speak. In terms of our road repair uh, projects, DPW is requesting 2.25 million for the FY 2022 Village Street Paving Program. This is a bit less than last year, however, we do have some carryover funding. This highly successful program involves a partnership between the department and a private contractor selected through the government bidding and procurement process. I am pleased to report that this past year we have paved 11 streets so far at over 11,000 linear feet and a cost of almost 1.7 million. We still have pending a number of streets in numerous villages that are slated for paving and we will continue to work diligently to ensure they are completed in a timely manner. If you see the slide there, uh, these are the uh, streets that we completed over the past year and a half. Uh, there's about 11 of them total at, at close to about uh, 1.7 million. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, these are upcoming um, village uh, repair projects that we have ongoing. As a matter of fact, we are in Santa Rita today. We've been down there for about the last week. And again, this is a partnership between uh, the way it works is we go out there, we repair the road, uh, we do any uh, damage repairs, uh, repairing of, of base course. Uh, the contractor comes in and mills the old surface and then paves it uh, as, as soon as possible. It's, it's, it's very quick, uh, it's efficient, and uh, we, we think we get a quality product out of, uh, out of the, the contractor. And these roads should last easy 15 to another 15 to 20 years. But this is the list that we have upcoming uh, and planned for this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, you should have it in front of you also. I just wanted to talk a little bit our, about our building permits uh, section. The building permits and inspections uh, section of the CIP division is responsible for the enforcement of building codes and the review and processing of building permit applications for all public and private construction. Revenues are derived from 100% inspection and plan checking fees and 25% from the issuance of building permits. The other 50% of building fees are earmarked to the Guam Preservation Trust and 25% to the public library. Throughout the pandemic, the Permit Center continued to operate on a full-time basis by appointments. Of course, all health protocols were established and followed. We did this because we believed that if any industry had to continue to operate, it was the construction industry. Today, we continue to provide services from the following agencies. Ourselves, of course, DPW, EPA, Guam Fire, um, Department of Land Management, Public Health, uh, Department of Reve Revenue and Tax, and of course, the Treasurer of Guam. Uh, I am happy to report that uh, we are working towards streamlining the, uh, the permitting process, and we are working toward bringing the entire process online for homeowners, for contractors, and for the government as well. Uh, we've, we've seen a couple prototypes, uh, and uh, as I speak, hopefully within the, the next week, uh, there should be an RFP uh, to, to get that service online. And we, we believe that, that that'll bring a lot of efficiencies and cost savings to the uh, process. Uh, I, if I can, I, uh, I'd like to talk now about the capital improvement projects that we have ongoing. There's, uh, there's two slides. And those are those are local uh, projects. Some of them are some of them are, are federal funded, uh, uh, and um, those are ongoing. Um, some are in in the construction phase. Some are in the in the design phase. Uh, one we just finished was the uh, the foster care home up in uh, Barragata, Barragata Heights. Uh, but that's the that's a current list. I think there's about 20 projects. If you if if um, if you can see that. Next slide. Okay, uh, now I, I'd just like to talk a, a little bit also about some of our federal grants that we have. Uh, under our Federal Highway uh, Administration, um, we receive uh, funding for the construction of basically our primary routed roads and bridges. We, we project 14.6 uh, to a height of 15.2 will be received to, in FY 2022. Roadway projects we anticipate being funded through FHWA include the Route 1 Marine Drive repaving, which would start, should start within the next 30 to 45 days. 
uh, Route 14, Challenge San, Challenge San Antonio, uh, repaving. Uh, Route 28, which is Y Sengson Road, uh, that's up for repaving. Uh, Route 5, reconstruction and paving, that is, uh, we are in the middle of the, uh, the procurement and, and bid uh, as, I, as I speak. Uh, we also plan to upgrade certain traffic signals, road striping and marking, and guardrail repair. Uh, we also have another division that, that operates under DPW, and, and that's uh, from the National Highway Transport and Safety Administration, uh, NHTSA. Uh, we project the $1.4 million uh, from, uh, from NHTSA for FY 2022. This grant is used to operate and fund our Office of Highway Safety. Uh, this section provides educational outreach on traffic safety for impaired driving, occupant protection, speeding, distracted driving, pedestrian safety. Uh, we work with DPW, uh, DP, GPD uh, for DUI checkpoints, and of course the very popular Click It or Ticket program. Uh, one of the things I'd like to mention uh, in our efforts to curtail speeding and improve in driving, through this same funding, uh, we are procuring two digital speed limit signs that will, that will be used throughout the major roadways of Guam. These large digital signs will indicate a vehicle speed as it passes through a given road or highway. Uh, and this is known to be very effective. Uh, it, it informs the drivers basically what their speed is and, to, and hopefully to bring it down to a, a, a safe uh, speed limit. Another federal grant award anticipated for FY2022 is from the US EPA State Clean Diesel Grant Program, DARA. This grant program will assist DPW in pur purchasing new school buses to comply with US EPA's fuel emission standards. Um, the next two slides basically shows some of our, our COVID responses that we've been doing over the last um, 16, 18 months. And uh, as I mentioned last year, uh, this pandemic uh, really shifted our DPW operations and funding away from our normal business routine. Many of our maintenance duties uh, were held back and only recently have we uh, been able to catch up. And I must say we have a great group of dedicated and complete, com committed employees who have truly risen to the occasion in addressing many of the new duties and responsibilities we now carry. It appears many of these new tasks will continue throughout the upcoming fiscal year. As always, we stand ready to assist this government and our island in moving forward providing government services to our people. Again, Senators, on behalf of the fine women and men working at the Department of Public Works, I am very pleased to present our FY 2022 budget for your review and approval. My staff and I would be most happy to discuss our proposal and to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and Sezus Masi. Thank you, Mr. Ariel. Um, are you aware of the, uh, the, the ARP funds? Yes, sir, I am. That, that, that we were, that this body had requested that, that you be given from, to, by the governor is about $30 million? Yes, sir, I, I, I am aware of that. Okay, proposal. I just wanted to make sure because the other agencies weren't aware of, yes. of, of, of that issue. That. So I wanted to make sure you're aware because I know you, you're gonna ask for as much money as you can to take care of our roads, clean up our roads, mark our roads, protect the people of Guam. Yes, sir. I just want to ask you one off the bat. I have other questions to ask, but has, has DPW ever gotten with uh, GPD to maybe change the speed limit on our island? Because, you know, you're going to put up those digital speed limit sign, and the normal speed here in Guam is, they say 35, but the average is 45. So I'm just curious, has, that, has there been a study maybe that, that, that GPD is doing or you're considering to bring that, that issue up? Yes, Senator, that's actually a very good question. We are actually working, uh, as you know, we do have our program management uh, team uh, that consults with us on, on federal highway issues. And we have a, uh, an individual there who is a um, traffic engineer uh, that studies these kinds of things. And he was just here uh, last month. And so we are looking at, at uh, adjusting some of the speed limits throughout some of the areas uh, of Guam based on, of, uh, of course, signage and, and lane marking to make sure it, it continues to be safe. Uh, I haven't received his, uh, his report, but, but we are looking to increase speed limits in certain areas. All right, thank you. Does your department have any outstanding obligations 
including personal service, any, any outstanding obligations? We have, we have some unpaid obligations. Uh, uh, I believe they're, they're called uh, promise compensation to, to some individuals from previous, previous years that uh, we still show outstanding. Yes, sir. Okay, you, you are aware that in the Budget Act, you're allowed to pay that off if you have the funds for it. So right. Are, are, you, are you guys working at that or, you're st or is that still in litigation or? No, every, every year we try to get rid of uh, as much as, as we can, you know, by holding back on, on certain expenses, again, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, it, it really just depends on, on our, our current needs. If, uh, you know, like last year, we, we did receive some funding from, from CARE, so that kind of helped out a little bit, so we were able to uh, save on some end. But, you know, by and large, it's not, uh, we don't have a, a, a full, uh, uh, budget amount to, to take care of the entire uh, um, uh, promise compensation amount that that's that's due but we do have some unpaid uh, uh, issues all right if, if you can provide the committee please uh, um, the amount that you would need so maybe we can address that in FY 20, 2022 okay yes sir. okay do, do, do you have that amount with you today and if you do I, that'd be uh, I'd be in, and, if, and if you don't we, we can work with that hopefully we'll get that Tomorrow, if not today, um, I, I ha it's it's in the budget digest here, the the budget package. Uh, um, let me just double check this number, but I have 1.17 right now. Um, that that's what I'm showing here. But let me, I I prefer to uh, confirm that confirm and then get back to you, please. All right. H have you procured the majority of your budget supplies and equipment for the year? We're at the tail end right now of the year, so have, have you pretty much? Uh, procured all the supplies and equipment for the year? Yes, yes, we have, sir. Okay. Uh, you, you already reported about your capital outlet projects. There are 57 unfunded vacancies under local funds. Am I correct? How many? 57. I, no, I don't have that amount. No, no, I think we're, we're at seven at, at the that moment. Is, that's unfunded. Unfunded. Oh, unfunded. Unfunded. Unfunded, unfunded yes. There's, there's quite a number of uh, positions that are okay, unfunded. Okay. Um, Maybe what you need, or what I'm going to lead to, is that if you can tell us which of the, how many of those positions are considered critical, so that you yeah. know. As as I mentioned, Senator, uh, what what we're considering uh, uh, primary and priority would would be the bus drivers. Those positions are constantly open. Those con positions are constantly being filled, you know, for for um, um, obvious reasons. Um, okay. School buses have to run. School's about to start, full time, face time, face to face. So. Uh, we are always hiring bus drivers. We, we lost a few, we've, we, you know, throughout the year we're always losing bus drivers to retirement, uh, but we, the, the positions are always open, so we're always rehiring. All right, so, so basically they're funded, but I'm, I'm actually looking at the positions that are unfunded vacancies. Right. Um, I, could, I can expect that the uh, bus drivers will always be funded. So Correct. When the need comes, you can fill it. You also have 52 funded vacancies under your federal programs. How many do you anticipate to fill for FY 2022? Um, the, hard, the, the issue we're having with our federal programs, especially under highways, is the, the, the recruitment and filling of engineers. I may have spoken about this at last year's budget hearing. Uh, the issue with, with hiring engineers is our salary uh, levels just don't compete with even our, our, our other GovGuam agencies, such as Waterworks or GPA. Certainly doesn't compete with the, with the private sector, uh, or even the military for that matter. Uh, but there's a, there's a huge demand for, for engineers throughout the island. Uh, this military buildup has, has, uh, has, has caused uh, a lot of that, uh, that shortage, uh, because they're basically being gobbled up by, uh, by private companies, by the military, a lot of construction companies, uh, and and they they are they're paying com really competitive wages, versus starting at, at DPW. I think the starting salary for an engineer is what, thirty six thirty seven thousand. We're not even close to what's happening out there in the in the uh, in the the, the engineering uh, market out there in the the private sector. All right. So, but, but uh, Senator, I we are working with DOA to to get the. I forget the term that they use to either reclass the salaries or reassign the salaries uh, and hopefully to get them to a, a competitive level. 
All right. Um, you know, there's an. It is only. It's, it is an ongoing comment in the Guam Highway Fund audit that there are expenditures unrelated to highway or transportation. These are mainly due to the uh, salaries and wages of the mayors at the mayor's council of Guam. And we were looking at moving that funding source to DPW so you can take care of what needs to be taken care of on the roads. So the mayors can get off the roads and let DPW handle it. You're handling the main roads right now. Um, please comment how uh, these occurrence, or how this can impact and help your operation. Because you're yeah. doing it now anyway, but you just don't have enough money. Right. I think the, um, the OPA uh, made that citation. I think it was to the tune of about $7.1 million that was uh, uh, being uh, either appropriated or used by the mayors, and it was actually for Guam Highway maintenance. And so I believe that was a citation by the uh, uh, public auditor. Um, and I, if, if I read the law correctly, it is for, it is for highway maintenance, for road maintenance. Uh, I, I think in the, in the past, uh, you know, DPW had, a, had a, a staffing level of well over 1,000 people. Today, as we speak, we're at about 260. Uh, so a, I believe a good chunk of that money when it was given to the mayors, it was for them to take care of, you know, a lot of their primary streets and a lot of their primary roads and village roads as well. Uh, I have to admit, you know, there, there are some villages that actually do the work. They, they get out there and they assist us with uh, maintaining the roads, uh, filling potholes, doing a lot of the roadside maintenance, brush cutting, and, and the like. Uh, there, are, there are other villages that, that uh, you know, we find ourselves always assisting uh, to, to, to a large extent. So, you know, if, if that's the pleasure of, of the, the legislature, we'd be... We'd, we'd be uh, we'd be very accommodating with that. I mean, because uh, that's the intent of the law, is we're in charge of road maintenance, uh, you know, and uh, we've got all the equipment. Uh, it, we'll ju we just have to hire a lot of new manpower and then get them out on, on uh, regular schedules. Because right now, as we speak, Senator, uh, DPW just plays catch up. We're, we're strictly reactive with our short uh, staffing. We react to uh, grass growing, we react to floods, we react to road uh, repairs and, and things of that nature because it's just, it's just a short, uh, small staffing level that we have. All right, but maybe if we could hear a commitment from you, Director, that if you got, if you received the funding, you'd be able to take care of the villages. That's, that's really what I was trying to lead to, hoping that you can comment that if we, if we, we were to shift from the mayors we, sh we should cer certainly make, uh, make a marked improvement if, if we had the proper funding. Absolutely. All right, then. Thank you. Uh, do you feel that the department's, uh, your budget request, even though it's reduced, uh, represent the true needs of the department to meet its core mission and objectives? I, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator. The do you feel the department's FY 2022 budget Request represents the true needs of the department to meet its core mission and objectives. Well, I, I think at this point, uh, Senator, uh, it, it has to because the, that's that's the the ceiling that uh, was uh, was was given to us by by the governor and and BBMR. And uh, you know, as in all fiscal years, we will make it work. Uh, we know that we've got some money coming in uh, from the American Rescue Plan. I understand also that. Uh, we may have additional funding from uh, our federal highway um, uh, program. So, you know, um, when we put all the funding sources together, uh, we, we're going to, you know, that, that's up to management to try to find a way and make sure that it works, that our, our mandates are, are, are completed and our mandates are fulfilled. So we, uh, you know, as, just as we, as we did through COVID, nobody expected COVID. And, uh, you know, we, we've made it over the last 16, 18 months. All right. Thank you, sir. And now I ask, I'd like to also recognize that Senator uh, Taito has joined us. I'd like to ask the oversight chair um, if she has any questions, and then we'll begin with uh, the speaker and then the, my vice chair. S Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Good morning, Senator. <clears throat> I just have... Um, we did, we, we received an email from one of our constituents 
Um, but I think I can talk to you offline because it's a personnel matter. Um, and uh, I'd like to focus on the budget. For the Guam Highway Fund, Village Street, and Road Resurfacing projects that you presented on slide eight, are these contracted or are you going to execute these projects within DPW's force structure? It's a, uh, Senator, it's a, it's a partnership between ourselves and a contractor. Uh, a bid was released um, many months ago. Uh, we just signed a contract and, and it was, uh, it was uh, won by Hawaiian Rock. We signed a contract about maybe a month and a half, if not two months ago. Um, so uh, a lot of the village streets, uh, it, like I mentioned earlier, we've already started in Santa Rita. And so the way that works is um, the contract works is, is we, DPW goes in there uh, and we go in there and we, we prepare the road for paving. Uh, we strip whatever uh, road degradations there are. We fix up the base course and then Hawaiian Rock comes in and, and for the most part just mills and grinds out, out about an inch to two inches of the old pavement. And then from there they'll lay on a new uh, coat of, of asphalt. So it's a, it's a partnership between ourselves and Hawaiian Rock and it works very well. Very efficient. Fast. Okay, thank you. I, and um, there was, I was wondering, we've been trying for several years to put a traffic light up by Laddie Heights where there's these bus stops from the back road of, of Mingilao. And so I was wondering, are you foreseeing anything to add in that within your National Highway uh, Traffic Administration? Yes, I believe I there's been studies in the past and it, the studies do show that there is um, a traffic light needed and you have bus stops on both sides of the roads and the cars are speeding down. And so you, we even um, did a video sending it to the previous director to, um, to mediate that and we haven't received any word back. Right, I think there's, there's about two if not three intersections in that same area along Route 15 okay. that's slated for traffic marking and signals. So um, I'm trying to remember if I signed the contract for that. But I know that, that, that the, the bid uh, was, was completed for that. And so that, 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 is, that is certainly an upcoming project. Uh, that and I believe two other intersections in that same uh, Route 15. Okay. So that, that will certainly be addressed. And we're, so, we're starting to see a lot of bicyclists on the road. Are you starting to create a plan for adding bike lanes within our main highways? Yeah, yes, Senator. Um, you know, that's a real, real big safety issue. I know uh, many years ago they, they made a bike lane as part of Marine Drive, as part of some of the major routes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's just, I, I know the bicycle com community just uh, probably increased tenfold during this pandemic. Everybody just went and yeah. decided to get into bicycling. So they're all over the place. Um, to, to, to do a real bike lane, it really should be off the main highway where cars and vehicles really, um, really um, uh, travel. To do a real bike lane, it requires at least four feet of, of pavement off the main highway. Uh, and in a lot of our, the areas of, of our main routes and our highways, we simply don't have that, we just don't have that space. If you look at the most, if not all, of Marine Drive, there's, once you get from the road, it goes to a sidewalk. So there's, there's almost no space. And I know they, they tried to create a certain bike lane within the, the two outer lanes. I believe it's still there. But uh, even that, that is very, very unsafe. Um, you know, what can we do about uh, installing bike lanes? That's going to take some real hard studying, you know, because even our federal ca counterpart in Hawaii is really concerned about putting a bike lane on a, on a, a vehicle travel lane. Okay, yes, that's, I, I just need to, I just would like to implore you to seek an urban planner and, and to move forward with such projects and we don't want to see another incident where, uh, and where someone hits a biker and, you know, it's a fatal accident. And yes, yes, yeah. I think that if we start planning for these things, I only foresee that the bicycle, the biking community will become much larger in the right. upcoming months and years. And so I'm hoping that you would um, work towards a plan 
and do whatever you can to start implementing or executing a bike lane where it's feasible in the interim. Yeah. I, I think in some of our out, outside routes, such as Route 8, Route 10, Route 2, Route 4 down south, I think, I think we can make accommodations for that. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly look at that because you're, you're right. The, the biking community has just exploded uh, throughout the pandemic. Thank you. Can you okay. Do you have any plans for the $30 million that the ARP funds um, that the legislature requested with the governor, which she agreed upon that those were her priority areas that do you have any plans that you're going to execute that $30 million for? I specifically speaking, um, you know, we did, uh, we did submit a, a budget to the governor's uh, office and BBMR uh, for ARP funding. Um, as I understand, it's still being reviewed by the governor's office and BBMR. Uh, I know the legislature had, had had a proposal for $30 million for, for the Department of Public Works. Uh, we certainly have plans uh, that, that we can use $30 million, both in terms of, of equipment, uh, buses, mm -hmm. uh, personnel, um, expansion of some of our programs that we have, mm -hmm. such as um, you know the, the derelict buildings that, that we've started, mm -hmm. uh, some of the abandoned vehicle uh, issues that we have. Um, uh, I, I may have uh, talked about it. You, it, it was, uh, some of it was in the list. Uh, we've got uh, uh, MSHA issues over at our coral pit that we need to take care of. We also have storm and sewer, uh, storm water uh, system uh, upgrades that we need to do um, be, uh, because we've got a, uh, we've got a, a permit and uh, we haven't got a citation yet from the US EPA, but we're working very closely with them to. Uh, to, to work on, uh, it's called MS4, uh, Municipal Storm Sewer System okay. Upgrades or something. So that's, that's uh, I, I think the tab on that is $8 million alone. So we've got, and, and that's an unfunded mandate. So okay. do we, could, could we use $30 million? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and, and we'd be ready to go at a, at a moment's notice. The concern is that you mentioned um, hiring more personnel and expansion with this money. and. We have to be very careful because I don't think the government will be able to continue that kind of growth for the years to come. And I'm hoping that you would actually use that money more towards infrastructure and building more roads towards unimproved roads, replacing them with, you know, real roads. And so, um, right. so people can get to their homes rather than have to go through roads of, that are unimproved with huge potholes in them. Um, really working towards what the community needs and not more hiring personnel. Mm -hmm. um, the government, I think at this stage that the government has the ability to contract these things out and I don't see it necessary to hire more people unless there's a concrete plan that you're going right. to yeah. uh, introduce. And we all know it's a gubernatorial year next year, so yeah, I, I, please I, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I think what we're looking at, Senator, is, is, is exactly what you're talking about, okay. about more sustainable projects that, you know, for buildings, for roads, things that last. And if we were going to hire people, it would really, I, again, our priority is bus drivers and okay. heavy equipment operators. Because, uh, you know, what we've been doing, uh, you know, Guam is a tropical island. We all know that. You, you turn around and, and the brush grows. Uh, and it's so much faster if you use heavy equipment uh, in, in terms of road maintenance than, than manpower. Uh, a, a simple uh, uh, side cutter can do the, the work of four men with bush cutters uh, easily. Yeah. And that's just one operator. Yes, and there's the technology to do right. that. Yeah. So um, unless it's something that the ARP fund should not be used to hire more personnel. It should be used to create uh, bids and so that we could yeah. use it so that the community the community as a whole can see the tangible results of this federal assistance um, so th thank you mr. director I want to thank all the employees at DPW for their thank hard you very work much, Senator. Um, and their continued efforts into achieving our goal to a more prosperous island thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you for your support thank you senator Nelson uh, mr. Ariola, just a Real simple question. Who controls the sidewalks? Is that DPW? Yes, sir. 
Okay, maybe you can convince GPA to get their poles off the sidewalk so people can walk on the sidewalk. <laughs> I just wanted to comment on that one. Uh, Madam Speaker, are, do you have any questions on that one? That, that, that's another issue we're, we're working on. Uh, we're actually um, bringing on an ADA administrator to tackle those issues because, as you know, the, the government of Guam has been taken to court and, and we are required to, um, to comply with uh, uh, a lot of the, the ADA requirements. And so we've been, we've been able to uh, uh, convince and get the approval of FHWA to bring on an ADA uh, administrator to oversee that entire program. Okay. Uh, and so we've been in contact with them uh, on a monthly basis. So hopefully right. we, we should be able to bring someone on board. Okay, soon. good. Maybe they can go underground that they were supposed to do anyway. Right. But, okay. All right. Madam Speaker, do you have any comments or yes. questions for yes. the panel? Thank you. And you're right. That was supposed to be do done, right, already? Yes, ma'am. But um, do you have an engineer on staff now? Uh, we, do we have a um, 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 chief engineer? Uh, we have an acting chief engineer right now. Okay. Yeah. Our, our chief engineer from last year moved down to the Port Authority of Guam. Yes, I saw that. So right. I'm wondering what's going on and over we, there now. Uh, we put out an advertisement. We put out a, a, a notice for a chief engineer. We did not get any takers. And again, a lot of that is it, it's, a, it's a function of, of, of uh, the salary. Okay, now you said you're working on getting a full complement of BUDS drivers by the new fiscal year, by October. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. And Definitely that, before, even before the uh, school starts because hopefully we, August, we're right? going face yeah. to face in August. Okay. There, there was one outstanding um, mass transit. I thought I heard them say that the property adjacent to yours that they are supposed to be using is not cleared yet. Is that correct? Yes. What happened, uh, Madam Speaker, is the legislature, uh, through law, um, deeded a piece of property in the backside of DPW. I believe it's about two acres. And, and that is, has basically been a cemetery, if you will, of old equipment, uh, heavy equipment, uh, some buses, you name it, it's been there for, for years. And so we've tried to get that, we have to get it cleaned up so that they can do a, a proper survey, uh, topography, I, I believe some geological work, and of course some uh, EPA work to make sure that the soil is clean. We sent, we sent out, we put a bid out uh, for removal of, of the equipment, and there were no takers. Um, we, we went out, and uh, I believe GRTA went out and did some, uh, got some quotes to remo remove some of them uh, within that, uh, within the, the, the procurement system, so some have been moved but not all. I think in the end, um, depending on how much they're able to move out, we're just, we're, we, when I say we, DPW, is uh, we're going to be saddled with moving some, some of the equipment, because some of it's already gone, but we're going to have to move some of the equipment over to the other side of the yard. You know, it's, it, it's a function of, of, of the economy. Right now, there's, uh, as I understand, there is no demand for scrap steel. And so nobody wants to take it, and, and it, it, it's costly to, to, to take all that heavy equipment. But we're working to get that property cleared for, for GRT. Trust, trust me, Sel Babalta, uh, he's on my call yeah. list every day. Good. Good. I know he's working and, hard to try to get that we're really that trying to help the, uh, help the agency. Okay. And then I'm very happy to hear that you got the RFP going out this week to, for the permitting uh, application oh, yes. to make it online. That's excellent. Uh, what is the funding source for that? Uh, that uh, let's see. I think I think we've got uh, I think we've got a DOI, DOI grant. I, I'd have to check on that, but we do have funding for that. Okay, and then um, so my main questions really center around uh, you're asking for a little bit less in your operations, and you're also asking for less in the uh, village streets projects. And you said today that you have some surplus. But, but what is actually coming in? Because that's funded by liquid fuels tax, right? Right. Yes, ma'am. And I guess I want to know, are we not able to keep up with, with what we're collecting? I mean, we're not able to use it quick enough? Or should we, I mean, you know, we did that because we wanted to double up on the projects. Right, so right. If, yeah, if you could just explain that more, why, uh, is this the most we can do, the list that you gave us for FY22? I'm glad you gave us a list. Thank you. That's, right. I, I like that. It's uh, accountable, right? We can keep track of whether we're, we're meeting our goals or not. 
but I guess I'm just curious, yeah, why, why would we ask for less if this is being funded out of a tax? Well, I, I, I think when, when we looked at it, you know, um, the COVID, COVID uh, um, uh, the pandemic surely put us behind with a lot of our, our paving issues. But, you know, to be truthful, we're also at the, the mercy, if you will, of, of one paving contractor here in Guam. Uh, and we're working very closely with them. So, um, you know, they're, they're about to start Route 1. And so when it comes to the village street paving programs, uh, you know, um, they look at our schedule. We, we get there, we, pay, we prep the road. They, they, they see in advance when they need to make a batch because you, you, you can't just get asphalt at, at, at any time. They have to plan to mix it uh, uh, and, and, and to prepare for it. So uh, on top of that, they also have many projects within the military base. So, you know, there's, o there's only one, it's, 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 a, it's an economic thing. We only have one, one contractor right now. And so we're kind of, uh, um, we're, not, we're not basically at their mercy, but you know, we're, we're, we're working with their schedule as well. For the long run, do you propose any other solution? Well, uh, I hear that there's a, a, a new uh, asphalt contractor coming on board. Uh, he's, he's got the equipment, uh, and so hopefully, uh, hopefully there, there might be a new contractor on board before the end of the year. That's the word out on the street. Did the DPW used to do that in-house? Oh, no. That, 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 that is very specialized work. Never? Uh, not that I recall. Okay, I don't uh, know. Asphalt paving? Yeah. Uh, uh, from, from what I've, I've heard, I don't, I don't believe DPW has ever had a, uh, 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 an actual uh, asphalt uh, paving machine or right. a batch plant, right. Okay, yeah. so do the mayors understand that, um, I guess we have the money available and we, we have the preparation available, but we're just kind of uh, at the mercy of these contractors, you're saying, to become right, available right, to right. pave these streets? Yeah. But they, 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 they certainly fill out uh, whatever our plan is for the year, they, they, they actually meet it. So, you know, uh, if, if you saw the, I think we had about 12 streets that we were going to pave throughout the year. Uh, that's very doable within the next 12 months. Okay, and if you did that, would you fully exhaust the balance of the fund? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Senator Amanda Shelton? I'd like to also recognize that we are also joined by Senator Atta, Tony Atta, thank you. Sujus Masi, Mr. Chair, Hafa day everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I think uh, the Chair uh, hit on my number one question, which was, um, uh, some past due obligations that we've spoken about before in past budget hearings I've written to you um, from constituent concerns uh, from employees who are you know waiting to be paid and so I'm glad that the chair is also encouraging you to use your existing budget to pay out those past due obligations for overtime pay for many mm -hmm. of your employees um, and I think um, that uh, that's something that you know people have been waiting for for many years and we don't want those sitting on our books here in the government it's not good business for us and we want to see those um, see those taken care of um, and I'm you know very thankful to you and the department for everything that you've been doing throughout the pandemic really going above and beyond your uh, scope of work to help uh, with with everything from the quarantine facility the airport and we're very thankful for for that service um, I I am very interested in the the manpower uh, issues that you discussed in in the um, in your uh, budget presentation here, and I recall from an article a few weeks ago, uh, you were discussing a program with the judiciary to uh, bring in uh, some uh, some people who are uh, in need of community service uh, who will be supporting the department. Can you discuss that program with us, and what is the progress at this time? Yes, basically it, it, it we are uh, for, as I believe they term it, low level offenders. Uh, and, and so we work with the judiciary. Uh, they send us their, uh, their clients, if you will, uh, and, we, and, and we interview them and, and we put them to work for the most part out in the field, such as picking up trash in the roadways before we start, you know, um, 
mowing the grass or bush cutting the grass, um, pothole repair. Um, you know, we try to make it also so that they're, they're not, uh, they're not um, faced with too much risk while being out in the highways. So a lot of it is, re is really just road repair, uh, some minor bush cutting, uh, depending on, on their, their capabilities, and, 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 and picking, picking up trash for the most part. Okay, how many uh, individuals do you think will take part in this? Oh, you know, as, as I mentioned to, the, uh, to the, uh, the, the judge at the time, you know, we'll, we'll take as many as, as they can. It's just a matter of keeping track of them and making sure we have enough supervisors to, to keep track of them. Okay, thank you very much. And I, um, I know you uh, discussed some of the, the permitting and the work that you're still doing through the department, and there have been uh, news articles about the online permitting process mm -hmm. popping up in the next few months. Can you give us the status of that? Um, the, an RFP should be released as, as I speak. I mean, I, I'm expecting it out any time. Uh, we've reviewed the RFP uh, at length. We have a task force that the governor created. Uh, I head it along with uh, the director of uh, revenue and taxation um, uh, because it's twofold. We want to we want to put the the permitting uh, uh, process online for not just building permits, but also for business licenses as well. Mm -hmm. And it would be similar to the uh, the vehicle registration, which is it, it, it's very efficient, very fast. Yeah, I think that's really exciting news for yes, a lot of people. It's a frustrating process that. Uh, we want to see streamlined and uh, easily accessible. So thank you for that work. And I know the task force has been working for many months to right. get this off the ground. So just Masi for that. Yes, it will. It, yeah. it is exciting. It's, it's, it's going to be a real, real boon for our, our homeowners and, and contractors as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Shelton. Senator Brown, do you have any questions or comments for the panel? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Hopefully, I think of all of us, hopefully we're still awake and conscious this morning. Uh, after a while, I think you're going to, we're going to have so many hearings, we won't be able to function anymore. But uh, yes, I do have a lot of questions for DPW. Certainly, I had the fortunate opportunity to be there for a couple of years mm -hmm. at that department. I wanted to start off with bus operations, because that's your biggest operation that you have. Um, and now you're in the summer months, and you said that hopefully by the end of the fiscal year, you would have uh, you know, been able to acquire enough bus drivers to fill the demand. I know the budget, you know, submittal was made a few months ago, but you list in the budget that you have about 179 buses, 179 runs, and 103 bus drivers. Is that still the number, 103, or has That's that adjusted? Oh, how many are you, new bus drivers are you training? And I wanted to ask, how are you training or certifying your, your new bus drivers? Because I know your previous uh, superintendent of bus ops actually was certified to train right. new bus drivers. So. Uh, since he's retired, how are you addressing certification of new bus drivers? Yeah, um, right now, our acting uh, uh, superintendent uh, is, is handling that. And you're right, our, our previous superintendent uh, retired after so many years. And so um, it's a matter of getting all of them, uh, not all of them, but most of not all. I, I definitely wanted all the supervisors to be certified in, in first aid, in driver ed, uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, and, and also to, to make sure that all our, our, our bus drivers pass and have a, I believe it's called a D license mm -hmm. to operate the buses and everything. So, because some of them do come in without a D license, so we have to, you know, we have to train them, we have to put them out on the field, we have to put them in the parking lot, yeah, we, and, and we have to get them OJT and a, and a lot of uh, uh, su uh, supervised training as well. But uh, do we want them certified? I, 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 we have to. It's, oh, okay, yeah. so who, who is certified that's training your new bus drivers that are coming on board? I, I believe Danny is, right, the, act, the acting is, and I believe some of our, our I, I can't name them right now, but I, I know a few of our supervisors are. Okay, but right. are they certified to do this type of training? I, I believe they are. I, I, I can com confirm that. Uh, I can't confirm that right now, but I can certainly get back to you on that. Well, I, I don't believe they are, unless it's something maybe I, they've I, done I, in the last I, 10 years, but I don't recall uh, that. Uh, I thought I had two now, two supervisors. Can you verify that to the yes, committee, which, and if you yeah. can CC me, because I, I, sure I am will. concerned that, um, I think we just want to make sure that our new bus drivers coming on board are trained by someone who is certified to do that training, because Correct. obviously they perform a very important job of transporting our children. But, you know, Mr. Oh, Director, yes. that's 
we'd hope you would know that information. Right. But if you can verify, I would like to know because I am concerned if new bus drivers are being brought on board, but they're not sort of, you know, they're not being trained by a certified trainer uh, to ensure that they, they know what they need to know with regards to operating our buses. Uh, with regards to drug testing, that's always been a concern to me, obviously, because of the type of work uh, that occurs, and particularly transporting our children. And mm -hmm. I have been aware of incidents, certainly during my time, unless it's miraculously changed, uh, where we ended up finding out that we had bus drivers who were on illegal substances, sometimes, unfortunately, as a result of an incident that happened um, that determined that they were on, common thing was crystal methamphetamine. And so obviously I'm gonna to wanna to ask you, um, how often have you been doing your drug testing on your bus drivers? Um, I think we've, we've uh, just in the past year alone, I think we did two, if not three, uh, um, drug tests, uh, spot drug tests, if, if, if you will. Um, I don't think, uh, definitely when, there, when, there's, when, when there's an incident, uh, a, a, a vehicle accident, uh, that driver goes and gets tested. Um, but we haven't had anything major to really warrant something, you know, like a, a mass drug testing thing. We might have had maybe two, if not three, over the last 12 months. So you've had two or three random drug testing over the last 12 months? Right. Of your, all your bus drivers. I mean, I'm sure you have to randomly pick them out, but... Right. It, not, not all of them. It was, it was like a spot random kind of thing for, for drug testing. Is it by substation? How, how are you doing it? By, by substation. Uh, you know, we, uh, at the time, uh, um, the superintendent would, would just randomly go throughout the, um, the bus stations and, and, and choose to, to randomly select who would uh, be drug tested. Uh, you know, you can't just, because once, once, once you start uh, uh, letting the word out, you know, that. It, the random drug test is, is the one that always tries to get, and what, I, what, what worked with me when I was at GTA was it, it usually worked on, after a three-day weekend. You know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, you go and you, you, you test them on Tuesdays, and, and the, 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 the chances of catching someone are a little bit higher than, say, in the middle of the week, say, Wednesday or Thursday. And what's your tolerance policy for positive drug tests of illegal substances, particularly with regards to bus drivers? You, you just mentioned it earlier, uh, Senator. Just the job that they do, transporting our children, is, is high enough. It's zero tolerance. Uh, you know, although I do have, we do have to follow the, the civil service rules with regard to with discipline and counseling and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but uh, it, it's a zero tolerance policy, and we don't, I just refer to, to legal counsel and civil service, and we handle it from there. With regards to your busing fleet, um, I'm aware that you have acquired some buses from Dodea, and I'm a little concerned as to the age of those buses. Uh, how many buses did you acquire from Dodea? I believe we, we, uh, we acquired about 27 of the buses. And what are the ages of those buses? I think they were about five, five to seven years. They were they were totally um, they they were given a, a total uh, assessment by our um, by our uh, our TM uh, division. Uh, everything mechanical, everything uh, structural, uh, everything aesthetic, uh, and it's also for for health reasons. You know, with the with that pandemic, but they they were they were assessed from from top to bottom front to back. Um, uh, as I understand, I think all of them passed. They were, in, they were actually in really good shape for, for six to seven year old uh, buses. They were in great shape. The only thing uh, might be a little bit of, of paint fading and, and some rust, but for the most part, structurally and mechanically, they were in great shape. How much did you pay for these buses? I believe 11,000 each. Can you provide the committee? Because I would like to know. Um, the model, the year, yes, the listing of those buses that you paid for. What do you anticipate the life use? And the reason I ask is because I know your maintenance division is already challenged. We're trying to address maintenance of your existing bus fleet. Uh, when I was at DPW, the oldest bus that we had in operation was 21 years. And that was relatively Perfect. old. I mean, you know, a few more years will be a classic, but most of us are not driving around 21-year-old uh, 
cars unless we have the time and effort to invest in them and we really love the car and we want to keep it as a classic or whatever the case may be but I'm just concerned about that and you're telling me they're only between five to seven years old so I'd like yes, to sir. see the year uh, the make and model of those buses if you can provide that to the committee as well um, and Mr. Chair I'll, I'll ask if you can include me in that because I would like to see that listing yes, and the amounts that were paid for that. Um, with regards to your maintenance fleet, how are you addressing that? Because they're always challenged, I mean, in terms of being able to get the parts that they need and then also just the workload. I mean, I, they literally, I know, strip those buses down, sometimes all the way down to the bare metal. They refurbish the, the flooring, the, the seats. I mean, I know they, they have to contract out the, uh, the seats to get repaired that are damaged. But I mean, they literally can and have rebuilt those buses from the bottom up. But of course, that takes a lot of time and effort and resources. Where are you with regards to your, your maintenance team that is addressing the maintenance of these buses. Yeah. The most we're doing, Senator, right now is, is doing reupholstery. But if the deck is gone, I, I, I've made a decision. I, I don't want that bus on the road. It, it, it's, it's, too, it's too much if you weigh the, uh, the age of the vehicle, the, the, of the bus, the condition of the, the vehicle. And uh, you, you know where I'm coming from, the, that big word, liability. If there's even a, 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 an appearance of, of potential liability uh, for the government or for myself, I, I just won't chance it. We, we, we just take it off the field. Uh, so, you know, these buses that we, we brought on board has, has really helped. Um, and as I, I mentioned earlier with the, with the chairman, uh, if we do get some uh, ARP funds, uh, we, we've, got, uh, we've got some plans for, uh, for new buses as well. Um, um, I, I, I believe the, the, the department, and I, I think I've mentioned this at, at previous budget hearings, I think if the department gets 10 buses every fiscal year, uh, within four or five years, you know, it, it, we'll have, we'll have a, a very responsible fleet, if you will, uh, and, and, and some, uh, a fleet that's, that, that's safe and, and we know is, is going to be reliable. But um, I think that, that, that's, that's always been my plan, to get, just get 10 every year, and it just supplements whatever we have. You, you know as well as I do, I think we've got some buses that are close to 20 years old. Uh, surprisingly, they're still running very strong structurally uh, and mechanically. Do you have, are you acquiring any new uh, buses for this fiscal year? Did you acquire, when was the last time you acquired new buses and how uh, many? I think the last time, well, this past year, I think we, we acquired six new ones from part of that DARA grant. Uh, and we'll, we'll look to uh, acquire some again this year, hopefully. Uh, more than the six if we, if we get uh, ARP funding. Of the, the Dodea buses that you've acquired, have they been put into operations in the fleet? Are you using them now to...? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. I wanted to ask with regards to summer school, are you doing busing for summer school? You know, sadly, Senator, even when uh, uh, we, had, we, we had prepared for the, the, the second opening of DOE, right, and I believe that happened in January. Uh, you know, we worked with DOE, we had all the buses ready, we had the same routes, we had, we had prepped the buses. We were going from 81 passengers down to 24. We knew we were going to do more routes because the, the bus capacity basically shrank by two-thirds. And sadly, there were no kids, both for, both for the, the second part of, of uh, uh, DOE um, um, instruction and also for summer school. At best, we were lucky to have five kids on a bus. Um, but, you know, as I understand, and we're working with DOE as we speak, this coming August, it's going to be full face-to-face, -face, and as I understand, they're not going to be having any online classes. So we expect, uh, we expect uh, full busing to, to resume come August. How about for summer school? Are you transporting any students for summer school? I'm sorry? Are you transporting any students for summer school? I, God, I can't know. Summer school. Summer school, yes. Yeah. And yes, ma'am. And who is paying for the transportation for summer school? For, for summer school? It, 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 out of DPW, with, with, uh, with DOE students. Yeah, normally, normally the, at least it's been my experience that DOE pays for summer school transportation. Mm -hmm. I, I am not aware of that, Senator. Yeah. We, that, that's Normally, just of, those funds that, go into the X account for, for bus stops. That, that's part of, uh, you know, TEFF, the TEF fund. Can you go back and check and verify? Yes, because sure. normally, again, those funds go into the X account. Uh, I assume you don't know what the amount is right now that it's costing for summer school transportation? I, I don't have that right now, Senator. If you can follow yeah. up, I think that would be of good, course. too. Of course. 
that would be good to know. Um, with regards to any other employees, do you have any employees out of DPW that are assigned to any other government department or agency? That are? Assigned to any other department or agency? Um, yes, our controller has been assigned. She was originally assigned down at Department of Labor uh, to set up their compliance for, for all of the, the COVID activities, PUA and the like. And she just recently got assigned to assist public health with, uh, with their issues up there at, at public health, yeah. Do you not need your comptroller back at DPW? Oh, of, of, of course we need her, um, you know, but I, I am in regular contact with her. Uh, we also have a, a second in command uh, that's been her right hand person, May Duarte, I'm sure you know May. Uh, and so she, she did the entire budget process this year. So, uh, and, and she, she functions as, a, as an assistant controller and we're in close contact with her. Well, I, I Ar hope at some point Ar Arlene you'll, is, uh, you'll Arlene return your borrowed employee back to DPW at some point. I mean, I understand assisting with the pandemic, but as those things subside, I, I think that would be an expectation. Oh no, it's, it's my full intention to get her back. She's, she's very val valuable. Another area of interest to me are unmarked government vehicles. Uh, DPW, of course, processes all GovGuam vehicles that come into the inventory. And so certainly it's at that point at DPW that um, we have a mechanism of ensuring that all vehicles, unless they fall under unmarked vehicles for law enforcement, it's a very small definition in terms of what vehicles in the government of Guam fleet are not marked. Every other car is expected to be marked. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but I see there are a number of GovGuam vehicles on the road that are unmarked, including at DPW. Including? At DPW. You had your former uh, head of building maintenance that transferred a vehicle to the Port Authority of Guam that was unmarked. I also hear there are unmarked vehicles. Do you drive an unmarked vehicle? I drive a, I drive a government vehicle. Does it have the designation of DPW on it? I'll, I'll be honest, Senator. I just, it just came to my desk because it was a, um, it was a uh, what do you call it, a magnet sticker, and it literally flew off, both of them. And so, but I, I, I do have it. Uh, I just got it on last week. As a matter of fact, the car's out there, and, and you'll, you'll see the, 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 the place where the magnet was. Well, I, I just want to know what steps is DPW taking because, I mean, it's part of the budget process. I mean, the public sees these oh, vehicles driving around on the road and some of them have been, you know, the use has been abused. Um, you know, when I look at how much it costs to drive a bus a mile and how many dollars it costs, and then you also have the situation of um, government vehicles that are being misused as well because management is not properly overseeing the use of that. Um, and then when they're unmarked on top of it, which is in violation of the law, and I know that because I sponsored the legislation that put that in place for that right. requirement. So, I, I remember um, that. What steps are being taken to verify before these vehicles are released to department or agencies that they are marked properly as required by law? You know, uh, as, as I, I think I mentioned it also, that we are the custodian of, of all government vehicles. And I, I know our, our division head, um, Todd Gillen, he's... He is really diligent when it comes to, to, to letting vehicles out, not just for safety, but certainly for marking. Um, if, there's a, if there's an unmarked vehicle that's, that's out there, um, the only ones I know, Senator, would be, would be GPD. That's, that's the only ones I, I, I would know of. Well, there are unmarked government of Guam vehicles with orange license plates on the road that do not designate as required by law. And there's a sizing requirement, and there's a requirement that that vehicle has to be identified to a department or agency in the government of Guam. So again, I mean, that's part of your operations and your budget that you're required to do. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's not being done. Either that or do I think government employees are stripping the identification off the vehicles? I don't know. But I will, they are out on the road. Yeah. I, I, I will send out a directive reminding all agencies that that is the law. I also wanted, sorry, Mr. Chair, I just, I, I can't help myself, but I have to ask, you mentioned highway maintenance. I think we're all very appreciative in the community, all the work that is being done to actually, for DPW to, to be paving roads. Uh, when I was there, I mean, we paved the first road DPW paved in 10 years because essentially there was no equipment or resources to go out and do that. So I have to compliment your department in, in doing that. One area I see that continues to fall behind is the remarking of existing roadways. If a sign gets knocked down, it's knocked down. If a railing gets damaged, it's damaged. It doesn't get repaired. 
Um, we're getting to very visible areas that are high traffic that while the quality of the road is still relatively good, uh, the markings are almost totally invisible. Lifespan of reflectors may be five or six years, so that there's going to be a need, obviously, uh, to replace reflectors for visibility, especially at night if it's raining, if it's dark. Um, but there's very little work that's actually done to do that. And while I understand you have a contractor that performs this work, at least when I left the agency, we had acquired a substantial number of reflectors and the thermoplastic painting machines so that DPW could execute those smaller projects. And in the years since, I've seen some of that work being done, but not done to a level of consistency where the public notices it and sees the improvement. Uh, some of those reflectors, arrows, I mean, those things are pre-made. Uh, they can be laid. They don't necessarily have to be painted. They can be pre-made and uh, with thermoplastic heat uh, essentially you know, embossed into the, into the pavement. What, what efforts are you looking at to address that? Because I would say publicly, that's the main concern a lot of people have with our roads, but very little effort do we see to address that of existing roadways, right. especially our main, our main routed roadways. Our main areas. routes, yeah. Ab absolutely, Senator. Um, we have, a, um, uh, uh, we have three contracts that, that will start very shortly. They've all been signed. One is for exactly what you, you just mentioned, striping and marking of all our major highways and, and, and routes. Uh, that'll start, uh, the contract's already done with that. The other contract is for guardrail repair, and you're right, the, you know, uh, guardrails get damaged and they just stay damaged for, for years. So. We've got a contract out for that uh, to repair all, uh, most, if not all, our guardrails. And then the third one is for traffic, traffic signals, traffic, um, traffic uh, signal markings, and, and traffic signs. So it basically addresses uh, your concern there. What we are doing, though, uh, like if you'll see Route 8, uh, that's scheduled for lane striping and marking. But, you know, I drove that myself the other night when it was raining. You, you couldn't see anything. And so we had the, we, we just did it, we're doing it internally, uh, lane striping, some of the, the high, high traffic areas until, until the contractor can go out there and actually do the marking. So we did route, we started route eight, um, I think Saturday. Yeah, we started route eight Saturday and, and, shed, and that should be complete within, weather permitting within the next week. Well, I see this past year with the overpass next to the airport um, on Route 10A that with community support, that was repainted. Again, that's something almost hasn't been redone in 10 years. Right. So I think we all recognize the safety issue, and I won't belabor that, but I think it would be good for you to give us that, that uh, what your schedule is, and just so that we can get public awareness on where that work's being done, so people have some sense of comfort that something is being done. Uh, one of the complaints that were forwarded to my office that I gave to the uh, oversight chair earlier this year had to do with one of your, your unclassified limited term employees that was being charged or receiving overtime. I don't know if that matter was brought to your attention, but that's, what the, that's the one complaint I've received so far this year that I received from several different sources of concern that you had an LTA employee um, who was overseeing the, I guess this had to do with regards to the bus operations of transporting um, our visitors or returning residents from the airport to the hotels and that because that was an unclassified LTA, they were concerned as to why this individual was receiving overtime and why they were essentially overseeing that operation, whether there was a need yeah. to do it or not. I, I, I would need a name and a position, Senator. I, I, I can't answer that right now. Who's your current deputy? Uh, Linda Vanis. Then that narrows it down. That's the name that was provided to me. I prefer not to say it, but uh, that individual is listed in your staffing pattern as an LTA. Okay. I can look into that. Yes, ma'am. Are you aware of it? Am I aware of? That particular concern, this because this information is coming from your people. Not that she was. Uh, she's been a classified employee. Is she classified or is she unclassified? No, she's unclassified now because she's a deputy, but she, she was a classified employee. In your staffing pattern here, she's listed as an LTA. It's in your budget. No. Look no, it up. She, she, was, she was classified. Operations. In your budget, it says LTA next to her name hmm. on that position. I'd have to check that, Senator. Well, yeah. verify it because, sure. again, these complaints sure. are coming from your own personnel that were concerned okay. that you had this individual overseeing their work, which they felt was unnecessary. 
uh, and adding additional uh, amounts of money and cost of overtime that they felt was unnecessary. And I guess in their view, they weren't happy with it. So I'm relaying it to you to, to review it and make sure that there is no abuse yes, to yeah. that. Um, I'm almost wrapping up, Mr. Chair. I did want to inquire with regards, because you have responsibility of the, over the inspection station down at the Port Authority of Guam. Uh, what is the status of that? The last report we heard here was that that particular facility was inoperable because repairs needed to be made. It's almost been down for almost a year. What are you guys doing to address the repairs of, of uh, the test facility? Uh, yeah, the, the, yes, ma'am. The facility was down for, I'd say, almost nine months. Um, again, it was a procurement issue, uh, Senator. Um, we, we, we bought the parts. We had to bring out a te technician to get it all uh, repaired. Uh, I believe as of mid-June, the repairs were done. Uh, it went through testing. Um, I haven't been told whether it's, I, have, I don't have confirmation with is, whether it is 100% uh, operational. Uh, because even, even after the repairs were done, we were still having issues with, uh, uh, and some glitches with the system. Uh, and uh, I haven't received confirmation that is, it is 100% uh, uh, functional, but they are, they are they're continuing uh, to do testing. So it should be up and running by, by the end of the month, 100%. But it, it was repaired, and it, I think that cost, God, almost about 28 grand just for parts alone. You know, it's, it's got all those uh, electronic parts and gizmos yeah, and I, stuff. I, I, I yeah. understand. You I, understand, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to belabor any further questions, Mr. Director, but again, I, I'm hopeful that the, the request we've made for information that you provided to the committee and definitely with regards to the issue of unmarked vehicles, if you can oh, yes. discuss that with Mr. Gillum and, and make sure that he does address the issue of insuring because I, I might have to uh, get on the bandwagon here with Senator Tello and inquire whether or not we should put fines and penalties uh, to government officials for not ensuring that those requirements are put in place because hey. I'm seeing a lackness of that. And again, there's a reason for those requirements so that uh, we don't see that abuse. I've, hey. never had, I've never had an official vehicle in the time hey. I've ever served in any capacity of overseeing a department or agency simply because I feel there's more resources needed. And if I need to use a vehicle to go out on inspection, I do it during working hours. I drive my car to and from wherever it is I'm assigned. I, hope more directors, unless they're involved in emergency response, would set that right. example. So right. a, with that, a, Mr. Chair, I, thank I, you very I, much. Will, uh, I will commit a directive will be out before, before Friday. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. S Senator Nelson, before I ask Senator Adda, she wanted to respond to something that I guess the director might have forgotten, but she got an answer for you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Director, I just want to remind you, perhaps you forgot that I did speak with you about a complaint coming to our office in reference to what Senator Brown was talking about, and that was early on in the term. And you said that you would look into it, and then you called me back and you said that it has been, um, there was, there was n no, um, basically it was not true. So you went into the personnel files and you, you looked at the timesheets and you said that it was not true and that you know that your, your office is working above board for the statement that Senator, Senator Brown made for the personnel matter. What I want to talk to you about is another personnel matter. But that personnel matter, you told me that you, you assured that it was not happening in that manner that they addressed the complaint to our office. Do you remember? I'll be honest. Whoops. I'll be honest, Senator. I don't recall. Um, okay. Uh, I'd, I'd be more than I. I. I'm. I'm as open as. Okay. You want me to be? I. I'll, Got it. I'll share anything you have. Absolutely. You know, or anything you need. Please give me a call. I'd. I'd okay. be more than happy to share Thank anything you. with you. Sure. I. I document um, the conversations I have. So. Sure. I'll open it up and I'll. I'll sure. send it to you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Senator Adder, do you have any questions or comments for the panel? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I didn't previously, but now I do. So uh, good morning, Director. Good morning, Senator. Uh, thank you for being here and for your budget presentation. You know, I, I noticed you were mentioning about the Route 8 um, striping project. You said that's in-house, being done from in-house? 
just, just for now until we can get the, the, the private contractors out there to do the, 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 the permanent striping and marking. So if you're able, to, you have the ability and the capabilities to actually do it in-house, is that being done year-round um, throughout the island or? I you mean, know, yeah, Senator, as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, with, with our current staffing levels, we are, we are purely reactive. Uh, it, it, we, we just don't have in, in, enough manpower to even plan ahead and schedule this and schedule this for striping, this for road maintenance, this for pothole repair. We are, we are jumping throughout the island and, and that's, that's a function of our, our short staffing. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when things are, 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 are critical, that's basically when, when we have to react and almost every day something's critical. That's just, that's just, the, way, that's just the way we function. We can try to plan as much as, you, as, as we can, but, but when you just have a shortage of staff, um, you know, they can't be all over the island as, 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 uh, as we would like them to be. As I mentioned before, um, many years ago, well before Senator Joanne's time, there, Gov, uh, DPW had a, a, a staff of well over 1,100 employees. We're at 260 now. Yeah. And, and Senator Joanne knows the deal. When you don't have staff, you're, you're very reactive. And it's just, I guess, through the times. And I think part of it was, you know, a lot of the staff and, and the funding went to the mayors. So, you know, that $7.1 million is a lot of money. Uh, I could certainly, we could certainly use it and, you know, not to ding the mayors, but, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's what happens. Yeah, that, that, that's understood, <laughs> but you're, you're, you know, you, you have a budget reduction of 837000 Wouldn't you have been able to utilize some of that money to bring in additional people for road stripings, you know, throughout the year? And, I mean, uh, uh, Senator Brown has mentioned it, that, you know, even at night, even you mentioned it, even at night that, you know, it's, it's difficult to see the lanes, especially when it rains and things mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, I was just kind of concerned about that as to why would we not well, we, have that on a continuous yeah. basis, you know, and what, what is the, what is a contract costing the government of Guam, you know, con, uh, contracting out the, this work, you know, are we saving money or are we spending more money for less, uh, linear footage of uh, road striping. I, I think, uh, just in, in my short time there, uh, clearly, the, clearly when a private contractor does the, the road striping, uh, they're, they're, they're just much more experienced at it. They have the right machines, they have the right people, and they, can, they, they really stripe fast. I, they, they just have the right equipment. Um, our, we, we, have, we have some equipment, but it's just, it's not, it's just not as efficient as, as what the, the private company does, because they, they do it every day. Yeah, I see. Okay, and the other the other question I had was, you know, throughout the island, especially on our new roads that have been, just been recently paved, we see the, you know, a contractor or GWA going in and breaking up the road, but yet there is a law in place that says they have to repair it back to um, the way it was or even better condition uh, prior to the uh, excavation. Is anyone from DPW going out to check these contractors or GWA as they complete a project? Uh, y yes, we are, uh, sir. 90% of those road uh, cut-ins, if you will, are from GWA. We have worked very closely with GWA, me personally, with the general manager. Uh, we entered into an MOA for, for their repairs at our standards and at their expense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I believe they committed, I believe they committed about $2 million to, to go and, and, and make those, those, uh, those repairs the right way, uh, according to our standards. One of the things you might want to consider um, uh, are, are traffic engineers that, that uh, I'm sure you're, you're, you're aware of them. They, they suggested that, uh, because they do this in, in certain counties in the states, that if a certain road or a highway is paved, you can't touch it for five years. Uh, I kind of like that idea <laughs> because it, that's exactly what you're talking to mm -hmm. is, you know, we lay down a road and within two years, you know, a contractor g comes and cuts in uh, to tie in either a water line or a sewer line and so on and so forth. But then again, you know, a lot of that is just, again, a function of, of our space. You yeah. know, we have the highways here and it's not like we have enough space to put a sewer manhole and, on both sides of the road. Sewer manholes are typically right in, you know, because of uh, easements and... Yeah. 
and, uh, and uh, um, land restrictions. So that's kind of what we're faced with. The ideal, of course, would be have to, to have water lines on both sides of the road and sewer lines on both sides of the road and telecommunication lines on both sides of the road. But yeah, where I we see. stand today... Um, you know, I just don't... It, you know, the, the residents of Agate and Santa Rita, they're, they're just getting their roads paved now, right, you know, in the village. And I just don't want them, oh, a year from now, you know, clamoring as to why the road was yeah, no. dug up again and things like that. So yeah. we want to make sure that once we pave these roads that, you know, if a contractor or a GWA, a government agency, goes in and digs it up, that it has, I mean, not just repair the section that they dug up, repair a whole, the whole section. Right. No, thank yeah, Waterworks has our list. We mm -hmm. work very closely with them. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had to wait for them uh, down in Agate because they had to do some repairs before we went in. Okay. So, so uh, we, we work very closely with them, and that's the deal. We don't pave a road until they know about it, and, and all their whatever they need to do under that road is already done. Okay. You know, and then with, I noticed uh, also the abandoned vehicles from the mayors, but yet you requested no funding for that. Where do you... Where, where do you get your fun, where are you anticipating to get your funding from? Well, the, the, the funding the from that you? comes from the, the recycling fund, mm -hmm. I believe, out of EPA. And okay. then EPA grants it to the mayors. But, but if you, uh, I, I know there's been talk and there's been proposals to, to hand that back to DPW. Uh, and the reason why we haven't been doing it, uh, even though technically and statutorily, it really falls under DPW. Uh, I think the way it works is the, the director, uh, can either appoint or, or um, give the authority to other individuals, i.e. mayors, to cite these cars that are on public roadways or easements uh, and give them, a, I, I believe you give them a certain period and if they don't then you take it and you can either sell it, uh, take the funds uh, to pay for whatever work uh, or, or whatever resources were required to take it. Um, you could put it at auction. Uh, the law is pretty clear about what's supposed to be done. Okay. Um, Senator Brown had that concern about the, the uh, marking of official government vehicles and perhaps maybe what could be uh, a good um, recommendation is all government vehicles are supposed to be inspected annually and perhaps that should be a part of the inspection process is that government vehicles be marked according to their agency or department that they uh, belong to. So uh, when they go for inspection, the usual inspection goes through the process, horn, wipers, windshield, and then the last uh, notation there should be uh, right. department identification. Right. And I right. think uh, we need to get away from this magnetic uh, identifications, and it should be permanent, either painted on or a complete uh, decal, permanent decal on the vehicles, just like uh, GPD has. Um, that's something just for, for food for thought to ensure that all government vehicles that are supposed to be marked are visibly marked. Yeah, uh, I, I, I believe, I believe as, as the director, I, I, I'm almost positive I have the authority. So in that directive, I, because I, you're right, there are some there are some government decals that are about as big as this. You, you can't even tell. Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll, what I'll do in that directive is I'll give, uh, what's that, specific size uh, limitations. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank right. you, Director. Thank you yes. for your no, time. Thank you. Great yeah. working with you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all the questions I have. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Mr. Uh, Ariola, before I ask the oversight uh, final question, but Maybe what you can establish at DPW, because you have one guy that assigned right to make sure the vehicles marked. I'm, I'm sorry. The, 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 the vehicles need to be marked before they roll out, right? Yes, sir. So yes, that sir. you don't have to worry too much about it and it can start. You have the stencil made before the vehicle rolls, you spray it. This is government, government of Guam vehicle. Then it will force the other stickers to get back on. At least when it rolls out pending, There's the department the getting the sticker put on. It's marked from the rear. Because every, n nobody follows the car on the side, they follow it from the back or the front, right? So no matter what, if I'm traveling down the road, I see a yellow license plate, right above it should say, Government of Guam official vehicle, period. At least I don't know, it's, it's already marked, it starts the marking, then you finish it off of the rest. That being said, I'll ask uh, the oversight chair, she's got an alibi, a uh, couple questions wants to ask that she, Thank Over. you.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple alibis. The, the slide presentation that you presented to us today, you, you, know, you marked that one of the infrastructure projects is quoted a bid overrun. What does that mean? I believe it's, um, it's after slide eight, that's for sure. I believe that was that the bid came in over budget. Okay, and so what are you doing to rectify that or mediate it? So, you know, as, as we've done in a lot of our other projects, um, uh, with, uh, with the federal highways, we either de-scope it, um, scale it back, uh, whatever we're trying to build or Okay, I, I understand that you, there's several options for you to do, so I'm wondering, have you started implementing those options? Have we started implementing? I understand that there's several options that you can utilize mm -hmm. to if a bid goes over budget, right? Yes. But what are you doing for this specific project? Or is uh, it just a pending, a newly pending issue? The, the specific one, item number 11, governor's office? That's correct. Um, Thank you. Where are we on that path? It's repair of infrastructure okay. number 11, 500,000 bid overrun. So I just want to know, are you doing anything to fix it or you're still evaluating the yeah, options? Ms. Mr. Kanata just mentioned that we are de-scoping the, uh, the project. We're, we're, we're cutting back on a, a number of issues. Okay, so you're, you're changing the scope of work. Right. Okay. And then the stealth, the the stealth quarries, I came to you early on in the term about these, these issues, or maybe perhaps it was last year, about a lot of, um, there are some areas that are doing quarry projects that received a permit, but it was not permitted properly to do a quarry. What are you doing to rectify those? I, I believe, Senator, we closed down three. Okay. We closed three of them down because you're right, they come in for clearing and grading, and then later on, they, they do, it, it's a full-scale quarry project, and that's, that's totally different than okay. clearing and grading. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate that. And this, uh, the pool, you have a contract for a pool, the Salagula pool, what is that? Is that the Inarahan pool, are you building a new pool, is that the pool in Dededo? Um, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, th this is the Inarahan pool okay. that they're looking to make improvements to. Okay. I, I believe uh, either a wall or a stairs uh, either fell or is in disrepair. So they're, 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 they're basically safety improvements. Okay, and have you utilized... Um, are you working on fixing any of our public restrooms at our public parks? Oh, just... I think, you want to talk to that? We, we, we did a whole slew of, of uh, public restroom repairs uh, over the last 12, 16 months. Okay, because uh, I don't know if you don't open them up or they're locked down, so some of the people that go to the public restrooms, they're, they're not using the I, proper I, facilities. I, I think the... You know, we all know a, a, a big issue here is, is, is the homeless. You know, we, we had some, we, we um, renovated a lot of restrooms. We did the fixtures, complete change out. We gutted the whole, uh, 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 what's that, skeleton out, put in new fixtures, lighting, toilet bowls, uh, uh, plumbing and everything. And as long as they're open at night, uh, man, they just, they just get vandalized, Senator. And you know, that, 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 that's, under, that's under Parks and Rec. But we still have to deal with it because we got to go in there and either clean it or repair it or, right. you know, things like that nature. It's just a... Okay. Ice. And I noticed that um, a lot of the uh, restrooms by the beaches and also the showers available to rinse off at the beaches, they're not, um, they're not properly designed. So you have a knob to turn on the water, but then then there's no way to really scale down on the water usage. The water can run all night. So I'm talking about properly designed where you just push the uh. button and a limited amount of water comes out. And so are you looking at 
implementing a better infrastructure for the showers that are needed for the public. Uh, Joe uh, Pep here has basically been in charge of all the, the, the improvements at all the, the, the parks and all the, the beaches. Um, you know, we, we, tried, we tried doing that at, uh, um, I'm trying to remember which one, we even actually put locks on some of the spigots. Uh, it's, it's incredible how creative a lot of these folks get to, to just bypass that or, or, or to break it. One of the things I found out that if you lock something, sometimes it's better to just leave a spigot open than to actually put a lock. Because when you put a lock, then, then they break the, the entire everything from the pipe to the spigot to the lock. As opposed to if you leave it on, at least they use the water to wash their face or something. So right. you're, you're kind of... That's why I'm talking about the design, right? The design structure. Like, I don't know, in the 90s, um, actually, EPAL probably still has it. You just push the button and then water comes out. But in other areas, you have a spigot. Right. right, and you turn it, and so anyone can tamper it, any tamper with it. So I'm just wondering, or perhaps it's a recommendation that you can address the design and improve it so that water will be available for everyone that needs to use it, but you know it's also conserved okay. properly. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Senator. I believe in the past, uh, you know, I've been involved with several renovations for DPR restrooms. Pep, can you talk into the mic, please? I can't hear you. Thank you. What I was going to say was we've, uh, with DPR park restrooms in particular, they've gone through several designs, and uh, they, in my experience, they've always started with the uh, push, push on demand. Uh, then it gets vandalized or breaks for a particular reason, and then the repair contractor ends up just replacing with a shutoff valve. So uh, they've tried various options to control water usage, and uh, including the um, commercial grade uh, push valve. Maybe the push valve is vandalized because the water is not available 24 seven. Maybe I, they're, because so, the water shuts off when the park, when you close the gates to the park. I, I guess that's the way DPR functions, right? right. So maybe if you and just make the water available for the people because people still go to the beach in the evenings. Just to please, just a recommendation, okay. because the facilities are very poor. Um, I, I, I'm concerned that, you know, we are not doing our best for our community. And then when the tourists arrive, then that's when we start to spruce things up. But I think that it's a culture change that we need to do to start encouraging our community members to be responsive and protecting our beaches and our parks as well, showing them that, you know, that they are appreciated, our island community is appreciated, and then it would already be in place for the tourists to come. And so that's just, that's just you know, a, a recommendation and I, I hope we can come to some kind of um, middle ground. Yes. Okay, that's all I have and thank you very much. You. Oh, I do have one more question. You know, <laughs> so, there's this property um, right out here in Anigua where you have backfill right on the beach and so now they have a crane and they're installing some metal um, bars for foundation reinforcement perhaps. But from my understanding is that if you do backfill, it has to match the, um, the soil content or the sand content, especially along the beach. And it looks like they just threw, uh, I don't know, a, a completely different type. It looks like something from, I don't know, from maybe you would get in central, to northern Guam kind of backfill, not like something that you would see and, at the beach. So I'm just wondering, are you monitoring this and how did they get the permit to drop that type of backfill um, quality or comp, you know, composition when it, it's not even close to the area that it surrounds it? It's right on the beach property, yes, right Senator. on the sand. Yes, Senator, that, 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 that particular Can project. Can you turn on your mic, please, Mr. Oh, Director? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that, 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 um, that project was permitted. Uh, we did a stop order on that because he, uh, like you mentioned, he, he was that close to the beach. So they did a, um, uh, what's it called, a, a floodplain assessment that was required. So that was done uh, by a private contractor uh, and it, it basically uh, came out clean and so it was uh, approved by, the, by DPW uh, I believe by BSP also and the floodplain administrator. So the, the project was, was approved and everything. 
and uh, we're, we're, we're monitoring that, that closely. Okay, so the soil composition is actually correct? Um, I, I think I, they did it without your... I, I don't, I don't, rec you do I was work we were working with the, uh, the Guam Coastal Management, but I didn't see anything in there, even in the report, that required uh, the same type of sand, if you will, that had to be uh, filled in that area. I believe it's, it's further away from even an existing building that was already there. It's further away from the shoreline, as I understand. But I can, I can certainly take a closer look at that and work with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the folks at uh, Coastal Management. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, we see the same incidences in Tumon where you have an, a new uh, apartment structure pop up and they're already encroaching on the sand. And so I don't know how they managed to get access to or permitted for the extension to be actually on the sand and on the beach. Um, that is, it, just by looking at it, you can tell that it is a huge violation of, of our building codes. And so uh, I was just I was just flabbergasted about that. This is in Tumon? Yes, you know where the, you know where, um, what do they call it? The pink building. Where Mankui, the, the old, um, the old clothing shop. Where the Fakai store used to be, the pink building where Tenjudo massages. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yes, yes, I got it. I got it. Um, okay, uh, so I'm there's a new something. there's a new apartment complex there, and they're they're grossly encroaching on the beach. Okay, and that was allowed and that was permitted. So I'm hoping that we can avoid these types of developments where it's responsible, and it's within the statutes of the law. And if we need to correct the statutes of the law to be more environmentally conscious and sustainable, then please let us know that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank All right, you. thank you. Vince, just check fun, you know, check, just check what out, what's out there. Um, I only got one real simple one. I know you're responsible, your, your department is responsible to issue permit, building permits. And I think if I'm correct in the law, you're required that if you build more than one or two homes, it's called community development, right? You're supposed to contribute to the infrastructure upgrade. Am I correct or no? I believe it's three or more homes. Three or more homes. I'm just gonna ask that your department needs to be mindful when somebody comes in and they ask a permit today, six months down the line, they ask for the next permit. Then another year later, they ask for another permit. When we know for a fact all 10 homes are built the same way by the same contractor. And I, I believe that's a deception or a, a ways to avoid the community infrastructure upgrade. I say this because I know it's happening. Vince, just check on it. And with that, you guys just do what you need to do. You guys are doing a great job. That, that and also uh, along that same lines, uh, we're looking at, at proposed legislation because that, 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 that's a shortcut that everyone's taking. But not just, not just for community development, but also for, for water storm runoff. Um, I believe the, the, the standard is any more than six homes, if you build like six homes, you have to contain all the water within your property. So like, like you said, they're starting with two, then another two, then three, and like you, before, before you know it, you have 10 homes in, this, in a certain subdivision and there's no ponding basin. And then everybody else around the area gets flooded. Yep. So we, 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 have to, we have to close that loophole. Well, provide that proposal to your oversight or myself or any of us here, and I believe we'll We'll, we're welcome to introduce it and let's move on it. Okay? That being said, the committee will, con we will, we will conclude this budget hearing on the Department of Public Works. The committee will continue to receive testimony. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on General Government Operation Appropriation Housing and submit it via email to Senator Joe S. Sinoxian at gmail.com or to my office located at Rand Care Building, second floor, Suite 3, 761 Marine Corps Drive. Jesus Marcy for attendance and participation in today's hearing. And for those at home, thank you for watching the budget hearing on Bill 55-36 COR relative to the Department of Public Works is now adjourned. It is 1046, 47. Thank you and be safe. Take care.